Glad you're here this morning, and been uh, looking forward to today for some time. We spoke last week. Thank you, sir. That's very kind of you. We spoke last week about the the amazing power that comes from forgiveness, and the the release that there is, and what what being forgiven and what giving forgiveness does for us. It removes a lot of the excess baggage that we carry emotionally and spiritually. We don't really need to carry it. We choose to carry it. Forgiveness and, and, and releasing that, is, it's a huge burden to get rid of. We talked about how forgiveness is powerful in creating opportunities to restore broken relationships with those who are, uh, whom we love, those whom we had a relationship with and it's broken because of some kind of offense. And forgiveness is, is powerful in restoring those relationships. It's also something that we need to practice. It's a powerful Christian practice. It sets us free from our past sins, our past offenses. And, you know, I don't know of any other religion or even philosophy in the world that has a way whereby we can be released from the guilt and the burden of our sin and our wrongdoing. Because Jesus is the only one who can forgive sins. Forgiveness, though, it's actually a, a, a first step that's headed towards a goal of reconciliation. This is something I didn't really go into much next, last week. I was talking mainly about uh, how forgiveness can be so powerful in releasing us from burdens and so forth. But uh, forgiveness is actually leading toward the result, the desired result of reconciliation. And, and here's the thing. We're the body of Christ. Um, we call ourselves the church. We talk about going to church. We don't go to church. We go and be church. And uh, that's what we're doing today. We're being church. We're being the body of Christ. That means this, that as the body of Christ, we're the earthly representative of Jesus Christ. Now, if that's true and it is, that we're the earthly representative of Jesus Christ, and somebody says to you, well, I'd like to meet Jesus. What would you do? Well, what you should be able to do is say to them, well, here, come with me and let me show you what Jesus is about and bring them to be a part of this fellowship. And not just a part of the fellowship, and I'm not talking just about the service, but I'm saying being a part of what we do together as a church. Because in so doing, we should exhibit and illustrate what Jesus Christ is. If we, and so if we want to introduce someone to Jesus, they ought to be able to see Jesus in the fellowship of believers that we have here. So when we don't practice forgiveness, we don't, and, and we don't seek for reconciliation, then it results in discord, it results in dysfunction, broken relationships, and, and who wants to be a part of that? I mean, really. I've, I've been in churches that are like that. And um, even as a pastor, I've now thought, man, you know what? I really, <laughs> I don't really, really want to go there on Sunday. It's not something I want to be a part of. So for the body of Christ to live in harmony and in unity, when, in reconciliation, it's, it's something that needs to be desired and sought after. Not just something we hope that happens by and by, you know, maybe it'll happen and come together, but it needs to be something that we look after. And, and in, in the passage we're going to read in just a bit, it tells us there, he te Paul's teaching this church in Corinth, and that church in Corinth had trouble. When, when you read Paul's letters, that letter to that, <clears throat> excuse me, to that church in Corinth, and he dealt with a whole host of issues. And... He tells us in this passage that we have this ministry of reconciliation. Whatever we may think about our ministry, and by the way, folks, we do have a ministry. We do, every one of us. Uh, some of you may call me the minister or you call me the pastor, but uh, we are all ministers. We all have an area of service, an area of responsible whereby we are ministering, and he tells us that the ministry of that we have, it's clearly a ministry of reconciliation. In other words, if there's one thing that we should be looking for as evidence of Jesus Christ in our life, it's that we seek 
to reconcile relationships that have been broken or damaged with other people. It seems many ministries today emphasize justice and what this is kind of a kind of a clarion call in many churches in the states and that and, and folks justice is a good thing there's no doubt about it there's an incredible amount of injustice in the world but I don't believe that the answer to injustice is justice I believe the answer to injustice is reconciliation with God God is the judge who can give us the justice that's needed because God is pure holy undefiled and completely just. And if we're going to have that kind of justice, it's only as we find ourselves in relationship and reconciliation with God. So as we read this passage of Scripture from 2 Corinthians, uh, read, as we read it, notice the context is that uh, he's writing to this church, and this is the second letter that he's writing to the church in Corinth. They had a serious problem that he addressed very strongly in the first letter. They dealt with it, and there was a letter in between these, and now Paul is writing this letter, which we call 2 Corinthians, and he's talking to this church, encouraging them, and now speaking with regard to this matter of reconciliation. The reason he speaks about the matter of reconciliation is because one of the members in the church was living in immorality. It was well known by everybody in the church. They didn't do anything about it. Paul came right down and said, you call yourselves Christians, and yet you harbor this sin within the body? He said, put that person out. And that's the strongest, most severe punishment that can be ministered to any Christian on this world today, and that is to be put out of the fellowship of the body of believers. This particular person that he, in Corinthians, there was, there was uh, uh, confession. There was the admission of sin. There was repentance. There was the turn. And, and so they welcomed him back into the fellowship. And Paul here speaks about the ministry of reconciliation within the body of Christ. 2 Corinthians, reading from chapter 5, beginning with verse 11. Paul writes this. He says, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We're not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you, but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God, but if we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who were, for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, so from now on, because of what Jesus Christ has done, he says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. And, and let me just pause for right there for a moment. Paul speaking about himself, this is his own testimony. Paul at one time was a, 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 a stringent enemy of Jesus Christ and this new sect that he represented. He wanted nothing to do with it. The fact is, it's Paul who went from house to house in Jerusalem, arresting these new people who called themselves Christians, throwing them in jail. He then took a journey to Damascus where he was going to continue the same thing. And on the road to Damascus, he had an incredible experience of confronting Jesus, or Jesus Christ confronting him. Life-changing experience. Before this, he had regarded Christ according to the flesh. He was just some man who was a teacher, who was teaching these new things about the Messiah, claiming to be the Messiah. Paul said, nope, that's not you. Don't believe in that. And he was anti that. But now, he says, we don't regard him in the flesh. He has met Jesus Christ. He knows who he is. And he's responding to him in this way. Therefore, he says in verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. This is his testimony, folks. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. What he's talking about there is not behavior. 
He's talking about a new relationship that's taken place. The old relationship where I saw Jesus only as some good teacher, some good person, some man, that's no longer the case anymore. The relation now with Jesus is that I see him as my Messiah. I understand who Jesus is. So the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Listen, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That is just amazing. That is just amazing. Think about that. As you sit here today, if you have come to the cross of Jesus Christ and you recognize him as your Savior, you recognize him as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, there's, and not just recognize him, but you trust him in that, there's a transaction that's taken place. The transaction that took place at that moment is Jesus takes your sin upon himself. He became, he became my sin, your sin. And in exchange, let me take your sin, Jesus says, and let me give you my righteousness, the very righteousness of God. Listen, folks, we cannot come into God's presence without that transaction. There's no sin in God's presence. When we open up our, eye, our, our mouth and we begin to pray and to talk to God, we have to do so in the name and under Jesus because there's no other way to come to God. No other way. And we have to understand that when we do so, we are only doing so because we've been clothed and cleansed with the very righteousness of Jesus, who is God, the righteousness of God. Therefore, Jesus, God says to us, you're to come boldly into my presence. I'm bringing you into my presence that we can have this fellowship close and intimate because we have and are the very righteousness of Jesus Christ. Amazing. I know, you know, sometimes... In my own life, <laughs> and God knows this to be so true, that it, I sin. And I, you know, it's just like, Dave, come on. You know better than that. And sometimes we get so overwhelmed and so caught up in our sin when everything that Jesus has done has been to release us, to, to reconcile us, to forgive us of our sin. He says if we confess our sin. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and to bring us that righteousness. And so he, he's talking here about the fact that we, we, we have this incredible position that is in Jesus Christ, this new relationship, this relationship that Paul describes as the old being passed. It's not just a, a repaired relationship. It's not just even not even just restored relationship. It's being made brand new. Babies are not restored, are they? They're brand new, aren't they? So when we're born again, it's not just a restoration that takes place. It's not like taking the old, and, and, and I have an old 20-year-old car, you know, and I take very good care of it, but it's 20 years old. It's never going to be new again. It's not true with salvation. It's not true with being born again. It's new. It's a new life that, that he gives to us. And, and he tells us in this passage in verse 18, he speaks about rec uh, uh, reconciliation being declared. And that is this, that God designed a way. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled. He's designed a way for us to have a personal relationship with him because he's pardoned us. He's forgiven us. Open up the way. Paul experienced this reconciliation on the road to Damascus. It's an experience he never forgot. Never, never forgot. And the first thing he would want to tell people is, let me tell you about how I met Jesus. And he would tell his story. We all have that story. And he goes on to explain to them. I, 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 he goes on to tell us, I become a new man. Old things are passed away. His re relationship with God was 
totally new. He was reconciled. He had been brought into this fellowship. And from that day on, Paul was a different person. Conversion took place. It wasn't just Paul saying, okay, I'm going to say this prayer. If you'll say this prayer, you'll get saved. I'm sorry, folks. That doesn't save a person just saying a prayer. It's by faith that we're saved. It's by believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross and the, and the transaction. It's understanding a transaction takes place where Jesus takes all of our sin and gives us his righteousness. That's, that's the salvation. That's the change that takes place. It's not being religious. It's not doing the churchy thing. And we do the churchy thing because of the fact that we've been changed. Ministry of reconciliation. There's a couple of things about this the thing about forgiveness and reconciliation. Forgiveness and reconciliation, they, they work together. You can't have reconciliation without forgiveness. And forgiveness is the first step towards reconciliation. Forgiveness and reconciliation, is, they're, they're both from God, both demonstrated and illustrated and exhibited in the life of Jesus. So forgiveness is an act of God. We saw this last week uh, on the next slide there. He talks about how forgiveness is, is an act of God. Primarily forgiveness is releasing sinners. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. Forgiveness and reconciliation, he talks about the fact that reconciliation then is humanity being reconciled to God, not God to fallen humanity. Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2 says this, Behold, the Lord's hand is not short. It cannot save or his... It, it, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save or his ear dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between your, you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Reconciliation, then, is being reconciled to God. It's not God being reconciled for us. Sin is the cause of that. And the only way that that reconciliation takes place is because God comes to us in Jesus Christ. It's through the finished work of Jesus. Our sin is destroyed. We are, are, are reconciled with God. You see that in verse 19. And then he goes on and he says this. Paul says this in Ephesians. He, he says, We're no more strangers and foreigners. We're fellow citizens with the saints of the household of God. Check it out, folks. This is uh, from the word of God here. We, we implore on your behalf, he says, reconciling the world to himself. Therefore, we're ambassadors for Christ. But what does that mean, to be ambassadors for Christ? How can we be ambassadors for Christ if we don't have the practice of forgiveness and reconciliation? Now, typically it works like this. If you're an ambassador for a country, and let's say whatever country you're from, whatever passport you hold, let's just say then that you're an ambassador. When you're the ambassador, you're the representative of that country, and when you go to another country to represent them, you bring a message from your country to the one you go to. What's your message? If you're an American, let's say, What's your message? Well, our message typically is we're a democratic nation and we think you should be one too. And, uh, but we'll put that aside while we do business, so let's talk business. Uh, that's kind of cruel, isn't it? But there's a message. There's a message that comes across. So if we're ambassadors, then, which it says we're ambassadors of Christ, what's our message? What's our message? And the message he tells us, look in verse 19, and Christ was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. What is it that we're doing in this world? We're bringing to this world as ambassadors of Jesus Christ the message that, you know what? You can be reconciled with the Most High God. You can know Him. Not just some God, not some idols, not the local deities and so forth. Most high God. And be reconciled with him. Now then, 
how can we do that and be calling ourselves the ambassadors of the ministry of reconciliation if we don't practice that forgiveness and reconciliation here and now in this body? It's not an option. We're to be reconciled with one another. Our message to the world is as to how that is possible is first to be reconciled to God. How can we then, who are reconciled to God, our Father, not be in relationship with our brothers and sisters? Here, here's my point, folks. Uh, this is the body of Christ. If this is the body of Christ, we should be practicing these things as a picture, as an illustration of what it's like to be living as Christians in this world. So, that's why when we have the communion service, which we'll have next week, that's why we, we always ask ourselves to pause and to examine how are we doing within our own heart. Have we confessed sins? Have we received forgiveness? Because forgiveness and reconciliation is intimately tied up with the picture of the broken body and the blood of Jesus Christ. It would be a mockery then to be participating in this thing we call the communion as the body of Christ if then there's some conflict between brothers and sisters, especially within the body. Now, I'm not saying that you have to be lovey-dovey with everybody, but I am saying that if there's a conflict there, you should not be at the table. You should not be at the table. Because Jesus makes it very clear, or Paul makes it very clear when speaking to the church in Corinth. He says, if there is this conflict, then you should take care of that first. Because, you see, our message to this world is one of reconciliation, and if we're not practicing that reconciliation within this body, then, folks, we're not doing it outside either. And if we're the picture of Jesus Christ, then people should be able to come here and to see and experience how forgiveness and reconciliation are practiced. Besides, who wants to be part of a dysfunctional family? We want to be a part of a family that is showing the love, mercy, and the grace of Jesus Christ through forgiveness and reconciliation. Now, there's a couple of differences that we need to understand between forgiveness and reconciliation. Forgiveness and reconciliation. The first one is this. One person can forgive, but it takes two to reconcile. One person can forgive, but it takes two to reconcile. Well, that's pretty clear, isn't it? You, you see, for my part, through God's grace and through his spirit, I have the power to forgive anything and anyone. Not that I would, but that I should, and I could. Through the ministry of God's grace and through his spirit, that's true for every believer. That's true for every believer that through the Spirit and the presence of Jesus Christ in our life, we have the power, the capability to forgive anything to anyone. It doesn't depend on somebody else's behavior. It doesn't depend on what someone else does to me or says to me. It depends solely and completely on the finished work of Jesus Christ that he gives us this ministry through the presence of his spirit, to be able to forgive anything and to anyone. So reconciliation, though, is, is a multiple-person process. Forgiveness, I, I, can, I can do the forgiveness thing. But when it comes to reconciliation, then you, you have two people. And if both people, both parties, then, are not going to participate, then reconciliation can't be realized. So this is where the work comes, goes beyond our own ability. It goes completely onto the ability of God working in other people's lives to bring this to pass. This is where we have to depend on, on, the, on someone who's bigger and greater than, than we ourselves. This is where we realize very clearly the limitations we have without the Spirit of God. Because both have to ask and or offer forgiveness. Both have to choose to do whatever it takes to restore the, re the relationship. If one or the other doesn't want to or because they've been hurt, uh, it, it's not going to take place. Maybe even in, in, in your own life personally. You've been horribly wrong, terribly offended. You, you've been hurt deeply. And you'd like to be able to forgive, you know, and, and 
you know you can say, you know, I, I forgive this person, but I just don't feel safe yet to seek to restore the relationship. Well, that's understandable. That's understandable. But it's not a cloak to hide behind. It's something that we have to understand where we're at as we seek then through the ministry and the healing work of God's Spirit to restore that relationship. One might be ready to reconcile who, who um, you, you might come to the place where you're able to forgive and you're able now to seek reconciliation, but then the other party says, sorry, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't care to get reconciled at all. I don't like you and I don't plan to like you. Okay. So forgiveness takes place. Reconciliation is sought, but it's not realized until both parties come to realize that. On the other hand, forgiveness is an interior discipline. Forgiveness happens on the inside. Reconciliation is something that happens as an outward process. I may be terribly hurt, but before I can confront that person, I have to choose forgiveness. And this is what we talked about last week, is, is being able to choose and say, I, I seek to forgive. Again, folks, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that this is something we have to build ourselves up to. It's something we need to be on our knees about. It's a spiritual work where we say, I choose to forgive and so I may work silently and I may work privately on forgiveness I may pray and I may ask God and, and say God please lead me towards this forgiveness or I may see a counselor I may ask a pastor to help me and in going through this private process I find that the, the, the wrong that I thought wasn't um, uh, uh, as as bad as it was and, and so the reconciliation kind of flows from that from the forgiveness other times it doesn't work that way but when working on the reconciliation part, it's not what from within, it's when we step out and we seek the other. It's a hard part. It's really a hard part to do. And I, this week I was thinking again of the stories of the, uh, the Amish that I told last week about this schoolhouse murder who killed 10 of the Amish girls in, the, in their schoolhouse there and how the parents, I mean, they not only sought forgiveness, but they sought reconciliation. And, and that was the part that really touched my heart, was that they didn't just quietly say, well, we forgive you. No, they stepped out. They went to the family. They wrapped their arms around the family of their murderer. There were more Amish at the funeral of that murderer than there were of his own family. That's an amazing testimony of reconciliation. They didn't just gloss over it. It, it was recognized, but they were able to forgive, but they were able to and they were also able to take the next step of reconciliation. However, reconciliation couldn't be had if that family didn't respond. And the mother of the murderer responded to their reconciliation. And she also then came and, and, and sought to, I told how she then uh, spent men, much of her time serving and ministering and caring for one of the girls who had been shot and, and, uh, uh, in the head. She bathed her, she clothed her, she read stories to her, and, and just loved on her. I mean, folks, that's, that's a very good picture of reconciliation. And what a huge difference that is in a person's life to be able to, in reconciliation, to be able to express this love to a person rather than to, to, to suffer from separation and angst and anger and wrath and, and, and guilt and all these things that would come along with there's, when there's no forgiveness and no reconciliation. It's not easy to do. It can't be done unless both parties do that. But is this, here's the thing. This is the, th this is the point that I, I really want to drive home. It's not always easy to know when it's time for reconciliation. However, we do know it is always the ministry and the pursuit of those who call themselves Christians or followers of Jesus Christ. That is always our pursuit. It's interesting for me, just an interesting note, that we're not told in the Scriptures specifically to pursue justice, whereas as a people, we seek righteousness and righteousness and justice go together. But we're not told that justice is our pursuit. We're very clearly told here that we have a ministry of reconciliation. 
That's an important thing to understand, folks. But Jesus coming to the cross was to bring reconciliation between sinners who had no hope. If justice was to be done for us as sinners, the justice to be done is for us to go to hell and serve and, and to live forever separated from the goodness of God. That would be justice. Instead, Jesus took that punishment upon himself. He took that hurt and that pain upon himself, separation from God. His father turned his face. He took that on himself so that reconciliation could be meted out to you and I. And we need to understand that as difficult as it is, and, and when we have been sorely wronged, and it, come on, parents, it's especially true when it happens to our children. It's especially true when it happens to our children. What do we want? Man, we want justice. We want revenge. We want to do back to them what they did to our kids. Isn't that right? And that's not scriptural. As much, I, I, come on, as much as I as a parent have wanted that, this is what's different about us, folks. This is what, it, it, these, these are distinctives. It's not going to be understood by the world. They're going to think that you're weak and lazy and don't care, or don't love your kids because you don't want to get back at that person and see this thing taken care of. And, 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 and for those Amish people to have stepped out and not sought retaliation but to seek reconciliation, a lot of folks kind of shook their heads and said, are you nuts? They don't get it. Of course not. There's no example for anyone other than the testimony and the story and the, and the picture of Jesus Christ. That's all. If we're going to be like Jesus, we have to know that it is always, always, always the ministry and the pursuit of reconciliation. Forgiveness and reconciliation. So, forgiveness and reconciliation are not the same. They're not the same. But the next question is this. How do we move from forgiving someone to reconciling them and restoring the relationship? How do we make that move? How do we seek to do that? Because reconciliation, as we just said, it's often conditioned on the attitude, the actions of the offender. The aim is restoration, but it just doesn't happen like this. And in our fast food world, we like it to happen like this. I mean, if we don't have internet, don't we just get terribly upset because it, we don't get to talk right away, answer the, the Twitters and the, and the messages right away? I mean, that's the world we live in. And so it's hard for us to realize that some things just take time. Reconciliation is one of those things. But what's important to reconciliation is evidence of genuine forgiveness. And the role of confession and repentance. The evidence of genuine forgiveness is, is personal freedom from a vindictive and vengeful response. The role of confession and repentance is when an offended party works towards reconciliation. And first and foremost, the important step is what this genuine repentance would be like. Jesus talks about this. Jesus talks about this. I don't think I have the verse, but yes, I do. I have the quote from Jesus, and it says this. Here's what Jesus says. Uh, Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. Now look. And if he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. You must forgive him. With repentance comes forgiveness and restoration, reconciliation. But the question is this, how do I know if they genuinely repent. Because Jesus uses the illustration seven times in a day, and they say they repent. Now, now, repent, you need to understand, 
The English word repent, um, you, you kind of have to give a definition for us to really understand it. In Chinese, it's perfect. I really love the Chinese word for repentance. It's way guy. Way guy. Just like, it's like changing and turning around. I mean, it's like, way lai, way guy. You know, as the change of turning in, in a different direction. There's, there's no messing up on the, on, the, on, on the definition of what repentance means. It means that you've been doing one thing or going a particular direction, and when you wake up, you turn away and you go completely the other direction from it. That's wonderful. That's what repentance means. So when there's that kind of repentance and that kind of attitude that takes place, then when we see that change, he says, you have to forgive them. But what if they turn back and start doing the same thing? Well, if they turn back again, then you re- do it, re- forgive them again. Hey, why should that be so hard? You know how many times Jesus has done that for you and me? Do you know, do you know how many times that we have, have done the same thing over and over again? We go, oh, God, I am so sorry. You know, I, I just never want to do this again. It's, it's a horrible thing. And, 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 we, and we say, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to sin. Whatever the sin is. You know what that sin is. And yet, we find ourselves back in the same old place. And we go, oh, I'm sorry. I am so sorry. God, forgive me. I repent again. And he does that over and over for us. So, so let's don't be judgmental about someone who has a hard time, who, who repents, and he says, forgive them. But let me just give with you very quickly seven signs of genuine repentance. Uh, it will help us then because the idea, and not the idea, the, the goal, the purpose here is reconciliation. Reconciliation is closely caught up with confession and repentance because we can't be re- reconciled with God without confession and repentance on our side either, right? Unless we confess our sins. He tells us, and what does that mean? It means I am wrong. I have sin. We won't say those words and acknowledge it deep within our soul and then react to that in a way of repentance. That's what he says. If we do that, then he says, I will forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Seven signs of genuine repentance. First of all, accepting full responsibility for our actions. I did it. I did it. And uh, I didn't do it because somebody made me do it. I'm not going to talk about circumstances. I'm going to say, I did it. I'll take the responsibility for it. If we say, well, since you think I've done something wrong, I'm going to do it because you think I've done something wrong, then that's not accepting full responsibility. Or if you say, you know, if I have done anything to offend you, I'm sorry. Really? You have no idea and you're saying for sorry just in case you may have offended someone? No, it's saying, I have offended you, I'm sorry, I was wrong. It's accepting full responsibility for, their, for your actions. Also, welcoming accountability from others, saying, I, I want to be accountable. And this would be something that's very important for someone who's caught up in, in a sin that's it's just that you can't overcome on your own. You know what, folks? That's not unusual. That's not unusual. There's people who get caught up in drug abuse. There's people who get caught up in physical abuse. There's also people who get caught up in pornography in this, and they find that it's something that repeats, and you need some kind of accountability. Someone who says, I repent is someone who's not ashamed of saying, I will be held accountable. I want to be held accountable. Does not continue in the hurtful behavior or anything associated with it. There's a change that takes place. And this is particularly true of someone who may be in an abusive or violent relationship. You may be able to forgive that person, but reconciliation can't take place until this kind of behavior is changed. And, there's, and, and they don't continue in that kind of behavior. Does not have a defense, defensive attitude about being in the wrong. Well, you know, I'm sorry I did this, but... And then they go on and give all the reasons why they did what they knew they should do. Oh, it's just saying, hey, I'm wrong, Period. I'm not going to make excuses for it. I'm not going to try and justify it. I'm not going to try and cover it up and say, you know, it wasn't that bad. Someone who's repentant doesn't have a defensive attitude about being wrong. Doesn't dim- dismiss or downplay the hurtful behavior. I hurt you? Oh, it wasn't that bad. I mean, you know, it's no big deal, is it? 
But it's admitting and saying, ah, I'm sorry. I, 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 I hurt you and I'm sorry. Does not resent doubts about their sincerity or need to demonstrate sincerity. Now, this is also very important. You know, when, when, um, when dishonesty has taken place in a relationship and when, when that trust has been broken, you know, there's a doubt that comes from that. And there's not you, a person who's truly repented isn't, isn't going to say, hey, come on, get over it. You know, I've repented. I'm on my way now. No, they'll understand. They'll understand that there's a trust that's been broken, and now it's going to take a season of time to rebuild that trust, to rebuild that relationship. It's not going to happen right away. It's especially true when there's cases that involve r- repeated offenses and, and trust is broken. You know, and I, I've told you this before. That I'm not, I'm not a fan of rules, especially in our family. Uh, now, we have no rules in our family anymore because there's no kids. It's just me and my wife. And we know how to keep the rules already. So. <laughs> but even raising the kids, I, I wasn't a big fan of rules because it's so hard then. Kids do things. They do things wrong. But it, here's the thing. We had a few rules, and I just told them, kids, listen. There's one thing dad can't handle, and that is if you lie. So if you do something wrong, you know you've done something wrong, and, and you're, uh, don't lie about it. Just say, yeah, I did it. I was wrong. And you may have to suffer the consequences, but the difference is this. If you come to me and you, and, or if you admit you're wrong, we can take care of this, and our, our relationship will be just fine. I can trust you. But if you come to Dad and you say, and you lie about it, and you try to cover it up, and, you don't, and, you, and, you find, and I find out you've lied, then something horrible has happened. Our relationship is broken. Our trust is broken. I can't trust you anymore. Then you come to me and you ask for privileges, and I'm thinking, how can I trust you with privileges when I can't trust you to, to, to admit when you're wrong? And so this is particularly true. Someone who's truly repentant doesn't resent doubts about their sincerity because they've broken a trust, and so if you're repentant, you want to do what's necessary to restore that relationship of trust. Lastly, they make restitution when necessary. They make restitution. If something has been damaged, or there's something that's been broken, or there's some contract that's not been fulfilled, they, they make restitution. If they're wrong, I'll take care of it. I, 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 I caused this damage, I'll do it. The, these are signs of genuine repentance. These are things that you can see then when, when seeking restoration. You can look for them and you can and know that Genuine repentance has taken place. I just might make a little caveat here, and that is that Jesus says if they repent, that would mean that they would have had these genuine signs of repentance seven times and still broken. What does the Bible say? If they repent, forgive. It's forgiveness that's the first step toward reconciliation. Reconciliation is a process that takes place and, and has to be built on. So when Jesus is speaking about reconciliation, though, he's speaking about it in, in a bit of urgency. He goes this. Uh, in, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23, here's what he says. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there you remember that your brother is something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. What does Jesus think about the importance of reconciliation? He's saying that before you offer your gift, seek to be reconciled with your brother or sister, as the case may be. That's so in, in, in the mind of Jesus there, there seems to be a bit of urgency. Not, well, I'm going to wait and see. I, uh, honestly, you know, Jesus understands the situation. He also understands our heart, whether or not there's the seeking for it, whether or we're hiding behind some kind of excuse as to why we cannot seek reconciliation. Jesus shows here that there's, there's a, it's, it's important. It's not something to be taken lightly. But let's admit it. There's, there's a hesitancy sometimes. There's a... There's a, a holding back of reconciliation or seeking reconciliation. Forgiveness is not something that's easy. 
Forgiveness is, is something, though, that we can work on on the inside and by the grace and the mercy and through the Spirit of God, we can offer forgiveness. But we have to understand the next step then is to seek reconciliation. But it may take time. We may not be ready for it. So what I'd like to just give you are some guidelines for those who hesitate to seek reconciliation. But in giving these guidelines for the hesitancy for reconciliation, then you, you need to think about these things. First of all, he says this, be honest about your motives. Be honest about your motives. In other words, look within yourself. Be honest with yourself. Make sure that your desire is truly to do what pleases God. And what pleases God? What pleases God is when we seek reconciliation. When that's the desire of our heart. It pleases God to be seeking reconciliation, not seeking to get revenge. So that's why we have to be honest with ourselves. We can settle the, settle the matter of forgiveness. Joseph did. Joseph settled the matter of forgiveness, and he welcomed his brothers back, but the reconciliation took time before his brothers began to recognize who he was, and even after their dad died, they came and settled it and had sought and got reconciliation. But forgiveness was taken care of. So these guidelines for reconciliation, they're never retaliatory. They're never seeking revenge. Be honest about your own motives when you're hesitant to seek revenge. Reconciliation. Be humble in your attitude. Don't let pride ruin everything, and pride will ruin everything. Pride will ruin everything. Renounce the vengeful attitudes and, and seek then for reconciliation. So, on that regard, when we are humble in our attitude, don't demand a person earn your forgiveness. Wait, wait. Suppose Jesus said, you know, I'd really like to forgive you, but you need to earn it. How many of us would be on the forgiving chart? Then? Not likely. So, be humble in your attitude. The issue is not earning forgiveness, but working towards true reconciliation. Humility is absolutely essential. Those who seek vengeance, who seek retaliation, who would like to make sure that, man, I want to be sure justice is done. I'm not saying that justice is related to pride. Please don't get me wrong here. I'm simply saying that the message of Jesus Christ is one of reconciliation. It demands humility. The next, be prayerful about the one who hurts you. Jesus taught his disciples to pray for those who mistreat them. How often do we pray to mistreat them? I, an interesting story of someone who, um, uh, a, a close relative of mine, who um, was in a, it was in a working relationship. And this particular person was in administration and had been uh, uh, seemingly unkind and very strict toward my family member. My family member said, uh, I am praying that God pours out his punishment upon this person for what they did. Ah. Uh, I didn't know any better than to say anything, but I thought, wow, that's pretty powerful. I don't think it's particularly scriptural. It's amazing how our attitude toward another person can change when we pray for God to do his work in them. Let God take care of justice. Let God take care of making sure things are made right. And I'm going to make you a promise here, absolutely without any kind of ifs, ands, or buts, I promise you, Justice will be meted out. Maybe not in my lifetime, maybe not in this world, but justice absolutely will be meted out. And I have to be willing to let God do his justice in his time. Because he tells me that's not my responsibility. My responsibility is reconciliation. Forgiveness and reconciliation. Be willing to admit that maybe... You contributed to the problem. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, really? Maybe. Maybe there's something that you said. A man named Ken Sanding 
He writes a book called The Peacemaker, A Biblical Guide to Resolving Personal Conflict. And here's what he says. Even if you did not start the dispute, your lack of understanding, careless words, impatience, or failure to respond in a loving manner may have aggravated the situation. When this happens, it's easy to behave as though the other person's sins more than cancel out yours, which leaves you then with a self-righteous attitude that can retard forgiveness. The best way to overcome this tendency is to prayerfully examine your role in the conflict and then write down everything that you have done or failed to do that may have been a factor in contributing to this relationship and how it's broken. This is not seeking to promote equal blame. Well, you know, I'm not, I'm not as bad as you are. Maybe we're both wrong here. No, but what it is trying to do is to seek to realize what is my role? What have I done at this? And then maybe the first thing I need to do is to say, hey, listen, I'm, I'm sorry, I did Maybe the role of, of uh, giving forgiveness is seeking, first of all, to be forgiven. Such a step, uh, the next step is be honest with the offender. Not only to be honest with ourselves and our own motives, but be honest with the offender. Listen, if you're not ready yet to, um, to, to seek reconciliation, it's still too painful, hurts too much, then be honest. You can just say, you know, listen, I, I, I can't, I just am not ready yet. I, I can forgive you, but I'm not ready to, to seek reconciliation. Express it honestly. But don't use that as an excuse then to not seek and say, well, you know, it's been five years now and I still don't feel like there's enough time gone by to seek. No, that's, that's using manipulation uh, of this. Uh, of this. Be honest. Be objective about your hesitancy. Be objective to, to, to say, you know, here's, here's what the problem is. Being able to say, these are some things that I, I'm really dealing with here. Objectively, not things, you know, objective. For example, maybe the repeated confessions and the repeated offenses of the same thing make it hard for you to, to seek reconciliation. Okay, I mean, that's fairly objective. And clearly define why you're, you're, you're doubting the offender's sincerity. Be, just be honest. And if you've been forgiving already, you've been able to release yourself of the angst, in your, but you're not ready for the retaliation. So you can be able to sit down and say, I'm not ready to, to reestablish this relationship yet, and here's the reasons why. Be alert then to Satan's schemes, because we do have an enemy. In Ephesians, Paul talks about the possibility of giving Satan an opportunity. We talked about this last week, about the nail in the house. You know, I mean, the whole house is yours except that one nail. And, uh, and uh, that one nail, <laughs> the guy comes and puts a carcass of a dead deer, and pretty soon the whole house is his. And that's what Satan does. He says, you know what? You can live your life. The whole thing can be yours. You could do your Christian thing and so forth. I just want one little nail. I just want one little nail. And if we give him that place, we have to understand that he has these schemes, and he's trying his best. A little bit later, in that same passage, Paul says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander, let that be put from front. Why? Because those are giving place to Satan. Don't do that. He says, Be mindful of God's control. God is in control. Paul again wrote, he says, No temptation has overtaken you. This is such a good verse. No, no temptation has overtaken you but such as is common to man, and God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also that you may be able to endure. And he says a little bit later, we know that God works all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. When we're having a hard time forgiving someone, take time to note how God may be using that to work in our life. God's trying to teach us something. This is particularly important, I think, in a marriage relationship. We can learn from those arguments. We can learn from those times when we say something we shouldn't have and, 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 or done something we shouldn't. And, and to let God speak to us. Is this 
is this a fence that I'm working with? Is it an opportunity to see how God can be glorified? And then lastly, be realistic about the process. It is a process. Change requires time. And here's the thing, folks, and this is what I want to leave. Let's stop. I, I, I talked about forgiveness. I talked about reconciliation because it's not an option. The message is Jesus has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Jesus has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Every child of God has this ministry. So that means that we need to be a forgiving people. But we need not only to be forgiving, we need also to be seeking to restore relationships through reconciliation. This has got to be a characteristic of Christians. It takes time, it takes wisdom but it's something that we must practice. That's especially true in the body of Christ, especially true in Grace Church. We have this message that's been given to us, and we are to be ambassadors to carry this message of reconciliation to others. And how can we carry the message of reconciliation if we ourselves are not going to practice it? within this body. We've entrusted. He says, we're ambassadors for Christ. And as ambassadors, he's given us this message. I'm wondering, is this the message that we are giving out? Reconciliation. The hallmark of a healthy body is unity in its members. So let me say this. Don't make a pretense of being a Christian when you have a spirit of unforgiveness that does not practice forgiveness and seek res restoration to reconciliation. It's a hallmark of being a child of God. Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, we realize that uh, you, you've given us certain things that are to be characteristics. Why? Because they're characteristics of Jesus. Jesus, you're such a forgiving person. You... You've forgiven us for all our sin, not only forgiving us. You took our sin upon you, yourself. You gave us your righteousness in return. Oh, how we need to confess our sin to be right. And then not only that, Lord, having been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, you've given us the ministry, the service, and the work of reconciliation in this world. It can only be done through Jesus Christ. We're your people. This is your body. That's our message. May that be true in each one of us, I pray. In Jesus' name.